Welcome to The Art of Gardening. I'm your host, Melissa Lalo Johnson, and today I am super excited to have one of my very favorite uh, Instagram follows, uh, Meg Austin from Ninnesca Homestead. Meg, thank you so much for taking the time out of your super busy farm life to be here with us today. I would love to get started and get right into it. So can you tell us about yourself and exactly um, what you're doing and what zone you're gardening in and kind of give the, the listeners kind of an overview of what you do? Absolutely. Uh, my husband and I moved to the country in 2013. I was a dental hygienist and he was working for Wildlife and Parks. And both of us had grown up out in the country, but since you know graduating college and getting married, it was just really hard to find a place that we wanted to live in. I mean, we had a nice house in town, but he was a hunter, and so sometimes he'd be like butchering deer in our driveway when we lived in town, and <laughs> I was trying to turn our whole yard into a garden, and it just, it wasn't working. So when this property came up, we just, we jumped on it, and that's kind of, everything is history since then. Um, when we moved to this place, we had two children. I was working as a dental hygienist, and then we quickly had a third child, and I quit working, and that is when we started the garden. Um, this house was pretty much a blank slate. We had a house and a shed and a little over 20 acres, and most of the acreage was in wheat. And my husband and I are not farmers, so the wheat didn't really do a whole lot for us. We weren't that excited about it. The check that we got from it wasn't really worth all of the spraying and everything. I think we lost so many trees and bushes that first couple of years. So we ended up planting all of our acres back to a short grass prairie. Our soil is not great. <laughs> we are definitely Kansas prairie. It's like a sandy loam, very alkaline. Pretty much if you don't have like those you know, really long prairie grass roots, it's really hard to get stuff to grow here. So we planted our wheat to prairie grass, but then a few years later, we were able to get a grant through NRCS to, with this, um, we were able to get a grant with NRCS for the Monarch Pollinator Project, and we were able to convert all of that over to flower pollinators. That was in 2018, and that was so exciting for us. I will say that the, the result that we got was a little bit less flowery than I was expecting. I thought we were just going to have an obscene amount of sunflowers and milkweed and that it was just going to be like a, I thought it was just going to be like a really beautiful, overwhelming landscape. And it's not. I mean, it looks like a prairie, but when you get out in the grass, you can see it. It's, it's out there. It's just not as uh, prominent as what I thought. So we built our garden in 2017, and it's six raised beds. Um, we had to put a fence around it because we have a lot of trouble with deer, and we have a dog, and our dog really likes to find the shady spots in the garden. And usually that's like right in between tomatoes or somewhere where he shouldn't be. So the fence keeps the dog out. It keeps the deer out, keeps the rabbits out, which is a really nice bonus. The stock tank pool in the middle of our raised beds is pretty much my favorite feature. Even though my kids are older now, they still, they go out there and they swim all the time. My husband mowed the other day and he added cold water to it so he could hop in it. So we thought we were going to use it for like some hydroponic, like really sciencey thing and maybe put some fish in it, maybe water the beds from it. And we really, I mean, when I drain it, I do have a hose. I can siphon the water into the beds, but... For the most part, it's more just a swimming pool and we love it. And um, we. How often do you have to clean that? How often do you have to clean More often that? than what you would think. I, I clean it about once a week, and by day four or five, it's starting to look pretty bad, and you probably wouldn't want to hop in it. We could definitely put a filter on it and do like some like chlorination or something, but. I kind of like to not do that. So I grew up swimming in a, like an actual stock tank that cows actually drank out of. And it was green and mossy. And this is such an upgrade from that. My standards are really low. So we, we really like it. The other thing that I really like about our garden is we incorporated our chickens into it. We are kind of a farm, but definitely not a farm. We're definitely hobby status, I would say. We have... Um, Right now we have 10 chickens. There are five in the front garden area and then five that are like babies that are gonna get moved out when they get a little bit older. 
And the chickens are able to go around the perimeter of our garden, but they can't actually get into my plants. So right now we're having a plague of grasshoppers and it has just been a nightmare. And the chickens love to go around the run that's along the bottom of the garden and they snag the grasshoppers as they're trying to get in. A lot get through, but it has been very, very helpful to have that extra little line of defense with the chickens. Mm -hmm. Um, so then in 2020, when the pandemic hit, my husband was working from home. Um, a lot of state government jobs were working from home. And so we were homeschooling the kids because that's what everybody was doing. And we had a lot of time on our hands and we both are project people. So if we are actually home, we like to be doing and building and it was spring and the weather was nice. And we had all of this wood stacked on the side of our shed. So we built a second garden and we did it very simply. We didn't want to be buying anything because we weren't really sure about, you know, mail coming to the house or, you know, it was so weird back in that first few months. And we built some raised beds. They're small. They're really cute. They're about mm, three foot by six foot, maybe kind of an odd size. We just had some old cedar and this year we expanded that area added more raised beds added a greenhouse and then we put rock down in the pathway so it feels more like a garden in a perfect world i would just have one garden but now i have two so it's okay they they quit. i love your garden yeah it's your garden is my absolute favorite garden yeah. i remember when you started it Oh, I love it. It's a dream garden. If you haven't checked it out, um, you definitely. So tell me about, as people are listening to this, where, where, how can they find you? Where are you? Where's, where are your pages and how do you spell okay. uh, the name of your page? Okay. Um, when I started my Instagram account, Nina Scott Homestead, I started it based on the Nina Scott River, which runs right next to our property and everything in my town. I was just telling Melissa, everything is Nina Scott this, Nina Scott that. Nineska Electric, Nineska Vet Clinic, I mean everything. But then you get on the internet and I realized that I picked the hardest name for anybody to know. So it's N-I-N-N-E-S-C-A-H. <laughs> and it's named after the river. I have Nineska Homestead, which is my Instagram account. And then I have a uh, website that's mostly like food recipes, garden to table, homesteading type things. And that's ninascamade.com. And that's about it. So, okay. No, that's perfect. Cause I just wanted for, as we're talking uh -huh. about these different things, like how amazing your vegetable garden is, the stock tank, if anybody wanted to look it up, definitely check that out. Um, can you tell me in all of this though, as you started? So, because what you have today is pretty incredible that you guys have built this in just, you know, a, mm -hmm. a short period of time. What inspired you to do that? What was your inspiration to actually just to move on and do this? Well, my husband and I were ready to stop being horrible at growing tomatoes. <laughs> it sounds like such a little thing, but out here where our soil is so bad, I mean, it is so bad. If I wanted to go outside right now with a shovel and dig a hole, I'd have to put a sprinkler on it first. Like you're not getting anywhere. So we tried for the first few years that we lived here, we had some just traditional, you know, we had the rototiller and we cleared an area and we added compost and we did all the right things and we just could not grow anything. And so he wanted to grow tomatoes. I wanted something a little bit more aesthetic, a little bit more beautiful and functional. And we have a lot of bull snakes out here. He loves snakes. He grabs them when he finds them and he holds them and tells me how cool they are and I wanna get away from them. So the raised beds kind of make me feel more like I'm in nature, but it's more like a controlled, mm -hmm. structured nature. <laughs> so I, the raised beds are my idea. And then I was on, I think I might've been on maternity leave at that point. So we had, again, we had more time at home and it was a winter project. We had this nice big shed that he was able to build them in. And then he, well, I guess I'll start over at how he built them. So we didn't really have a plan for this garden. We just knew that we had some galvanized sheet metal that was eight foot by four foot. And we had some leftover wood from my in-laws had built a house. And so they had quite a lot of scrap wood and artificial decking and 
they didn't want it, so we inherited it. And the sheet metal is eight foot by four, so we knew the beds were going to be eight foot by four. And then one cut cut it in half, so that made like the actual rectangle of the bed. So we made six of those, and then we brought them outside, and we kind of just like could see if we could fit a wheelbarrow through the openings in between the beds. I mean, the whole thing was just like eyesight. I mean, it was just, does this look right? Does that look right? I'm not good at being like, okay, we're going to measure this to 36 feet and one eighth inch. And he is like so good at that. So I was more just like, well, let's make sure it fits in between the house and the shed and is at the same angle as the house. And he was more like, well, let's square this thing up. So it was kind of a... And then how did you, when you put the soil in, what exactly was your process for putting the soil and getting your soil perfect to be able to grow what you grow today? Yeah. I did not know what I was doing with the soil. This was before I knew anything about gardening. We ordered a truckload of soil. It was just topsoil from a field and they delivered it in a 20 ton truck and they dumped it and we borrowed a bobcat and we put the soil in before we put the fence up so that we were able to do it without a shovel. And it compacted like you would not believe. I mean, it settled it. Hindsight, what I do now when I get new raised beds is I do sticks and stumps and straw and leaves and I try to make it as messy down there at the bottom as possible. That way everything's like breaking down and building the soil and taking up room so I don't have to have that much soil in it. But that was a struggle. It took me probably three years to get to wow. fix the damage that we had done by not adding good, um, yeah. Um, Did you add a lot of compost or what, what exactly? Like now with the new beds, you're doing the sticks. So did, how did you break that down? Did you add, what soil amendments so, did you use? Yes. So every year after, so for my initial garden, those initial six beds, every year after that, I would buy llama manure from a neighbor. She, I took a master gardening class and one of the master gardeners was singing the praises of using fresh llama manure because Apparently the nitrogen was just perfect. You didn't have to compost it. And they all were like on the llama manure wagon. And so I was like, sign me up. So every year I was adding two or three bags of that to my soil. I started adding uh, kind of rotted down straw. Um, I have ordered compost before. I had some delivered that was, it just came from a garden center in a city nearby and it was pretty nice. I am pretty happy with it, I think. But every year I just try to like add new things and as the plants die back, if it's something that doesn't need to be pulled, I just snip it off at the ground and I let the roots stay in there. And I just, I try to be more mindful now than I was back when I started gardening because the soil, even in my new beds that are like brand new this year, just the way that we layered everything, I can already tell that we are way ahead of the game just by doing the different layers of compost and straw and sticks. And, um, I've been putting cottonseed burr or cottonseed holes over the top of the soil to kind of seal in the, mo seal in the moisture and like help everything to break down. And I'm pretty happy with those so far. Also, that was kind of an experiment this year, but it seems to be working. That's great. So you have the chickens that definitely help with mm -hmm. some of the pests. What other types of things have you dealt with over the years that you had to treat and how did you treat them? Over the years, I didn't do a thing. I planted enough that if we had problems, I would just kind of let some of the plants be sacrificial plants and we just wouldn't worry about it. This year, maybe last year, I guess, was the first time where I actually had a goal of putting food on the table. Before I was just playing. It was fun, it was beautiful, I really liked it, but now I want to like have food in my pantry and have food in my freezer and my attitude towards grasshoppers and squash bugs and all of that has changed a lot because they don't get my stuff anymore. So I have started learning, I'm trying to do organic. There have maybe been one or two things that I've maybe gotten out a little seven dust or something, but for the most part, mm -hmm. I've had really good luck with, um, so the first pest that we had to deal with, uh, caterpillars, caterpillars on, I planted out probably two dozen beds of different brassicas, you know, my cabbage and broccoli and all of that. 
And when the, when the caterpillars came, I had these beautiful plants that I had started in my basement and I was so proud of them. They were like two months old at this point. And then overnight, it was like there were little holes everywhere. And so I just kind of did some research and out here, everybody's in agriculture. So a lot of our friends are farmers or crop consultants. And I just kind of asked, you know, what is something that I can do that's going to get rid of these? And so they pointed me in the direction of BT, uh, Bacillus thurin thuringiensis. I don't know how to say it, mm -hmm. but it's considered organic. I think it does kill the, it'll kill worms and caterpillars and things like that because it kind of messes with their digestive system and then they're not able to eat, so they just die. And I had really good luck with that. If I religiously applied it when I was needing to apply it, I mean, it worked pretty well. What does that application look like? So if someone today is having problems with, you know, the caterpillars mm -hmm. or whatever it is, what is the first step? Like, where did you find it? What, uh, and how did you apply it? What were all the details to that? Well, I live in a really small rural area and I went to our hardware store and even our Walmart and nobody carried it. I ended up having to order it online, um, Amazon, <laughs> but it was, it was just called BT and you mix depending on the solution that you get. Mine was one tablespoon of BT to, I think it was two gallons of water. And then I put it in one of those pump spray bottles. And then I just hit the areas that had damage. So the cabbages, I didn't mind spraying all of those because you know the bees aren't going to land on the cabbages. They don't care about cabbages. But like sunflowers and things like that where I didn't really want to affect the pollinators, I would just make sure to spray at night. That way they weren't really on the plants as much. And then I would try to not hit any blooms or flowers or buds or anything like that. Cause most of my damage was occurring like on the lower and outer leaves. So I felt pretty comfortable doing it. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that's awesome. And that actually is a perfect segue into another thing that I absolutely love about you is these posts, these fabulous posts about your sourdough bread and your kombucha and your canning. Can you tell us a little bit about when that moment was that you were able to start to move things from outside, inside and using them and like, what are some of your favorite things to do? Okay. Um, I, I would say fermenting was kind of what started it for me. There are a lot of things that you can just take straight from the garden wash them off with a little bit of water, put them in a salt brine, and then just set them on your counter for two or three days. And then you have a uh, sauerkraut or fermented carrot sticks or fermented, uh, oh, Swiss chard. That was one that surprised me. I didn't think I'd like that. It kind of, the Swiss chard plant kind of tasted like a beet, but when you ferment it, it tastes delicious. So I would say, so, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but back up. So you, you cut it from the mm -hmm. plant, right? Mm -hmm. You bring it inside, you said you yep. wash it. How long, what is the process of the salt brine? How long do you keep it? Like break us down like step by step. Okay. So today I went outside and I picked a quite a, quite a nice little basket of cucumbers and I have them sitting on my counter. And tonight before I go to bed, I'm going to need about an hour to process them. I'm going to put them in icy cold water to kind of like rehydrate them, make sure that they're nice and plump. And then while that's sitting, while they're soaking in the ice water, I'm going to make a brine that's four cups of water, two cups of pickling salt, and you bring it to a boil and then you let it cool. And it doesn't have to be completely cool, but you don't want it to be hot. And then I've got mason jars and I'm going to pack those cucumbers in there. I usually either poke holes in them or I cut them into bite-sized pieces or sticks. That way the brine can actually penetrate and get in there. And then I'm going to add cloves of garlic, peppercorns, maybe some mustard seed or dill. I like this process because it's very forgiving. You just kind of do whatever. And as long as your brine is right, um, so I pour the brine over all of that and then I add weights. They just look like little glass, um, they look like little glass lids almost and they're kind of heavy and I just set them down on top of there because they're gonna push all of those vegetables down into the brine so that nothing is exposed to air. And then after that I put the lid on and I set it on my counter for two to three days, maybe four days and then it's done. Some people will open them and test them. I feel like every time we've ever opened a jar to test the flavor, 
I've always regretted it because we've always introduced mold or something and then I'm scared if we should eat it. So I have just completely stopped doing that and I'm just like, well, it looks a little cloudy, so I think we're ready. And that's what we do. And you can do that with pretty much anything. And it stays stored, so then you move it and store it mm -hmm. until it's a little cloudy. And then that's what your test is to know yep. when it's ready to yep. eat. Yep, it'll look a little bit cloudy. Awesome. Um, there could be a little bit of a white film on the top. Usually mine doesn't do that, though, because I'm usually paying attention to it. And then I put just a normal mason jar lid on it, and then I put it in my refrigerator. We have three refrigerators, so. I bet you do, I bet you do. I mean, it's fascinating when I see all these things that you put together um, from the farm. Can you tell us a little bit about your sourdough? I know that you had started doing sourdough within the last, what, year, two mm -hmm. years, um, and making these beautiful patterns in the, in the sourdough. Can you tell us about that? Sure, I started doing sourdough, I think it was fall 2019, and it, it was really fun for me because it was just like a very creative thing and a beautiful thing and a delicious thing, but it didn't really take that much work. Like, yes, I had to be home to do the different steps, but the steps were easy and enjoyable and I really didn't mind doing it. So my sourdough starter, instead of just being made from flour and water like most recipes call for, I found one that made it from a shredded apple put in there with the water and the flour. And it was supposed to introduce like more wild bacteria, which I think is kind of a cool thing about sourdough in general. So I shredded this apple. It was from our apple tree, had never been sprayed with anything. And I put it in a jar with the flour and water. And then I just went through the cycle every, I can't remember if it was every day or every 12 hours, you take a little out, you add in fresh water, fresh flour. And then pretty soon you have something that you're not sure if you should eat because it smells really funky and you've never done this before. And then sometimes it's bubbling and rising and falling. And it took about two weeks. And then I had a starter that I have been using ever since. And when I'm not baking with it, I can just put it in the refrigerator and it will stay for weeks. I mean, they say you should feed it once a week. I've definitely gone longer than that. And it just, the fermentation process. So when you say feed, mm -hmm. When you say feed it, what, how, how do you feed a okay. sourdough starter? So when you have your jar of sourdough starter, it's about halfway full. And once you want to bake with it, you have to take out half of that and replace it with fresh water and fresh flour. And then you stir it up. And then the starter is going to eat the flour in the water. It's going to get bubbly and get really big. And then you're ready to bake with it. When you... I, it bothered me. It seemed very wasteful that you had to remove a portion of it. There are so many recipes that you can use. You can do sourdough crackers, cinnamon rolls, bagels. I have quite a lot of recipes on my website now, but you can just do all kinds of things with that starter. So it's not like you're really throwing it away. And if you don't want to bake anything, feed it to the chickens or add it to your compost. It's all good stuff. Totally. It doesn't have to go in the trash can. Well, that's great. And thank you because I have always wanted to start something like that, but I haven't. And I saw you doing it and it made me definitely consider it. So I'm glad that you, I'm glad to know that it's something as simple as shredding an apple and putting some water and flour together. So thank you for that. Um, well, let's talk about this perfect segue into the animals. So tell us about your animal adventures. I know you have all kinds of stuff going on right now with these pigs. Um, can you tell us about how all that started and the journey that you've been on with the animals? Well, uh, we got a pig because I should have stayed off Facebook. <laughs> there was, there's all kinds of Facebook groups you can join and they're for like, you could do, I want to learn how to make sourdough. I want to learn about pigs. I want to learn about dairy cows. And I was in one for pigs because I had kind of thought my husband likes to do a lot of his homemade charcuterie. He likes to butcher and smoke meats and do all of the sausage and those things. So we had talked about getting some pigs and trying to do that on our own. And somebody had posted on Facebook that sometimes when you have pigs, you get a mama pig that doesn't have very good instincts and pigs are so big and the babies are so small that even if they're not aggressive, a lot of accidents can happen. And so we got our pig when the mom had accidentally or intentionally killed everybody in the litter except for the last two 
And so there was like this SOS on Facebook. It was, please help me. I don't have time to pan feed these pigs because you don't feed them a bottle. You stick them in a pie pan and they slurp it up off the ground. And I thought it would be a really good idea because I was home for the summer. I've got three little boys. I thought it would just be such a fun little project and it was a nightmare. You, my advice to anybody is never adopt an underage piglet. They are, I mean, if your heart's in the right place and you're doing it knowing that it might not work power to you, I will never do it again. They came, they were 36 hours old. They hadn't, they hadn't eaten in probably 12 hours. They were like this big. I mean, they were just skin and bones. One of them died almost immediately and my kids were devastated. And then the other one, I had to learn about iron shots and uh, deworming and it had mange and it tried to die for a month. Like this little thing lived in our house and it every day I was just surprised when I had to set an alarm every two hours, even at night. It was like having a newborn baby and it made it. And then we knew that we would not turn him into charcuterie because I was emotionally invested in this pig. So he, I think the whole, I think all of Instagram was emotionally invested in this pig. I mean, I remember literally <laughs> signing on to check your page to see what was going on with the yeah. pig. So and now he, it was adorable though. It was a great story. Well, I wouldn't do it again, but I'm glad we did. He is now like a full grown, disgusting male pig, but he's a dad. So he's had two litters of babies. We bought two sister pigs that were two years old and he had his first litter, well, the mama did in May and it went beautifully. I mean, just like perfect. Could not have asked for a better experience because we were all pretty nervous knowing what could be. Um, this other mama pig doesn't really have the instincts, but she's not mean. She's just kind of careless. So we have lost one piglet due to her accidentally laying down on it. And then we had another one that she did that too, but we were outside and we were able to like move her off. So I'm optimistic that we're going to get some pigs that we can raise and butcher. And then we can tell these wonderful tales of charcuterie that's amazing, but um, haven't eaten one yet. So I don't know. <laughs> well, can you tell us a little bit about like with the farm? What exactly are the farm chores that you manage day to day with having the animals that you have and how long does that take and what is that whole what does that look like? Like what's the responsibility level of something like that? Well, we are very fortunate. We have some friends that have beehives on our property and then we have some really good neighbors and all of them are really interested in pitching in if we need to be gone for a day or a weekend or a mini trip. Um so we have good help. That is number 1. Um but my, I'm home with the kids. This is my full-time gig. So we, we usually take about 30 minutes in the morning to do chores. It goes really fast. Right now we're in a pretty severe drought. The temperatures have been well over 100 degrees. And that is a completely different ball game than like a normal situation. So today I was probably out there six or seven times checking on water, hosing everybody off. Um, these kind of temperatures are pretty dangerous for livestock. But on a normal day, it's about 30 minutes, feed the pigs, feed the chickens, feed the dogs, check that everything has water um, pretty quick. And then again in the evenings, watering my garden is taking a long time right now because we are having trouble with our irrigation and it's not functioning. So I am hand watering all day, it feels like, because it's so hot. So normally I would just do it in the evenings, but now I'm being more attentive because I don't want everything to die on me. Yeah, that's great. Um, so tell us a little bit about um, if someone wanted to start their own garden, what, and they, they don't have any experience or maybe they have a little experience, what are some of the things that you could kind of, what, what has happened to you that you could give advice to others on how to make that journey a little easier? Okay. If I were starting from scratch and I had no infrastructure, I just was blank slate starting, I would only do raised beds. And here's why I, not only are they aesthetic and they're really convenient, but I ended up hurting my neck in 2019 and I cannot do anything where I'm like stooped over or bent over. So pulling weeds is out of the question. Never in a million years would I have thought that I would find myself in that situation in my early thirties. 
but I am so grateful that we had the raised beds because normal gardening would not be an option for me. The raised beds are also easier to control because you can put in the soil that you wanna have, you can put in the amendments that you wanna have. Everything is nice and contained and you don't get a lot of weeds. Um, I did have quite a lot of little cotton plants pop up after I mulched with the cotton, the cotton seed hole but you just pluck them right out and it's so easy. I feel like I spend no time doing the tasks that I don't like doing. I don't like weeding. So I would do raised beds. And if you can, I would install irrigation while you're installing your raised beds. So before you put anything on the ground, like rocks or mulch or whatever you have for your walkways, I would recommend running irrigation to the raised beds. And those are fairly simple to do. It seems complicated, but if you watch a few YouTube videos, you can figure it out. If we could figure it out, anybody can. So that's what I do. Those are great tips. Great tips. Okay, so let's wrap it up. I would like to do the um, seasonally relevant tip of the week. So I think for here, now I'm in Kansas City, so I'm probably what? I think I'm like four hours mm -hmm. from you. Four hours north? Yes. yes? Okay, so... Um, I think here in Kansas City, we are getting into the 100 degree temperatures. So the tip of the week for if you have an irrigation system is to go ahead and let that, uh, I run a like a one to two minute kind of refresher in the afternoon for the grass. I put that on about 1.30, 2 o'clock when it, the heat is at its highest. And I've had a lot of people say to me, oh, I thought you're not supposed to water things you know, in the high heat. That is definitely true for plants and for shrubbery and things like that. But however, the grass actually really loves that little break in the heat. Um, and it's actually something that I learned from listening to golf uh, superintendent podcasts. So that would be my tip right now as we start to really heat up is to give your lawn just a little kind of spritzer in the afternoon to kind of break that, that heat cycle. Uh, and it will definitely dry out within, you know, you don't want your lawn to ever be wet for 13 hours or more. So you definitely have that break before then, if you're on the, the watering cycle that night, it will, uh, or, you know, early in the morning of the next day, it'll break that. So do you have anything that is seasonally relevant for what, um, what you're dealing with in, what are we, July 19th? Yes, I completely agree with you. I have had our little tractor sprinkler, the kind that like crawls on the hose, that has been going to a different area of our lawn all day. I am not concerned about too much moisture hitting the grass or anything like that. This is not a typical situation where it's this hot. My advice would be to keep the ground covered. If you are able to put compost or mulch over it, I would keep at least several, at least an inch if not more, because that's going to not only keep the sun's rays from penetrating the soil and cooking the roots, especially if you're in a raised bed, but it's also going to hold in any moisture that you have. So water frequently, let it go deep. I don't get too hung up on, oh, I hope I don't grow a fungus or anything like that. It's too hot. The other thing we've done is we have removed all of the foliage on the bottom third of our plants. So tomatoes, peppers, sunflowers, anything that needs ventilation, we are just like giving it plenty of airflow so that whatever breeze it happens to catch, it's kind of got a chance to cool off. A happy accident that I discovered this year, we had some sunflowers that were accidentally planted in some of our raised beds from the birds. And they actually have provided like an umbrella of shade for my peppers. I will definitely be doing that again. I didn't even think to companion plant something big and tall, but it has really made a difference with those peppers because they're, it's like having a sunshade without having a sunshade. So that's my Absolutely. That's a great, great tip. And back to circle back to what you were saying earlier, I also do the drip line or watering with the hose. That's about 1030 every day during the summer. They get a nice drink every single day. If even for just a few minutes, it keeps everything from wilting. I don't have any wilted hydrangea. I don't have any wilted plants. I can take pictures in the middle of the day and everything is like glorious and singing. And it is because of that 1030 drip. So and to your point, it's really good in the heat of the summer to just give things a little bit of a break. So uh, that being said, I think we're wrapping up. Thank you so much for being on today. And um, go ahead and give a shout out again to your social media and your website for what that is. So how people can find My you. Instagram account is Nineska Homestead, N-I-N-N-E-S-C-A-H. And my website is nineskamade.com. Meg, you are awesome. Thank you so much for joining me and I will be talking to you soon. Thank you so much, Melissa. It was great to visit with you today.
thank you.